Thank you for joining XR Om, which is India's first AR VR focus podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Aditya Vishwanath, who's been part of Google Education team. He also earlier founded Maker Ghat and currently is the co-founder CEO at Inspirit VR. And his LinkedIn profile reads "Building a Metaverse for K-12 Science Education." So, Aditya, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. So, why don't we start with a brief introduction? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eddie. for having me here today uh, very excited to share what we have been working on and you know what the vision is here um i'm uh, born and raised in chennai bombay um, and bangalore actually um and uh, i've always been always wanted to and i've always considered myself to be an educator first and then a technology or a computer scientist uh, um next um and i think i stumbled upon the entire world of xr vr ar um now metaverses as well um as a consequence of identifying gaps in the classroom and in the K12 education space and then realizing that there might be an opportunity for these technologies to maybe add value um and uh, make some very significant changes um in how in terms of how people learn and engage today with online uh, learning tools um so that was kind of my journey um i that prompted me to go and do research in the world of education i um went to stanford um to start doing a phd in the learning sciences program where i very specifically my dissertation currently actually which i'm working on right now specifically is looking at the intersection of virtual reality and immersive learning and trying to understand how um these technologies can um uh, be used in meaningful ways to make uh, uh learning more engaging more interactive um and uh, offer new opportunities as well for learning you mentioned there's gaps in the education system K to it. What do you mean by that, and how do you think we can correct it? Yeah, I think uh, it's a it's a very complex uh, ecosystem, right? When you think of the K, to, and again, a lot of my work, my research, the work we do at Inspirit, exclusively focuses on K twelve uh, education as an entire continuum, right? There's higher ed, um, there's pre primary education, there's lifelong learning, um, and each of those. requires a completely different uh, framework or a rationale to operate um in k12 um and i wouldn't limit this just to india i think these are challenges that most of not all k12 systems around the world face is a it's a very complex system there are many different stakeholders that um play a role in shaping this this system you have administrators you have schools school districts you have different school systems and school types public private um and uh, and many other independent models that have been emerging there are teachers of course there are parents um and then there's the government there are standardized boards of education there are a bunch of different factors that play into what the curriculum is today um what teaching and learning looks like today what the tests test prep the test text testing system looks like today um the challenge across the board um is that uh, most learning is largely focused on information retrieval and information storage um or just largely memorization right um um and uh, while that may have been useful four decades ago or five decades ago when information access was not as prevalent as it is today um today clearly um we don't need people to remember um the capitals of countries or remember what the definition of um the might mitochondria is as long as you understand intuitively what and how the mitochondria plays a role in shaping um the building block of this of human life the cell um so um i think moving from what things are to how things are and why they are the way they are um needs to be a big shift in in, in like day to day learning and day to day teaching and that's significantly easier said than done i think um there's a lot of work that is happening towards making learning more active more uh, curiosity driven um more focused on building these critical thinking skills versus again just memorization and retention of information and uh, that is generally significantly harder to both teach and evaluate um therefore creating a lot of barriers um to changing curriculum or changing changing learning and teaching styles right so why don't we talk about inspirit vr what exactly are you building We're building 3d um and immersive uh, science content for teachers um we are a teacher first product um and uh, we are a consumer product in that sense as and we go straight to teachers um and uh, we we aren't like other many many i think education plays often work directly with institutions uh, or take a more b2b approach uh, we don't do that we work go straight um grassroots to the teacher and uh, what we identified was that most teachers especially science teachers um want to teach science um by having their students help them visualize stuff help them imagine what um 
it would look like if you were um, picking up a DNA molecule and understand the spatial setup and orientation and representation of that molecule. Um, that that idea of experientially learning science is baked into science because that's what science is. It is experiencing phenomena in life, in and around you. So. Um, we noticed that there was a huge gap in the in the access to information space where teachers were unable to find content that was meaningfully interactive in nature that allowed them to teach with these tools and these resources. So that's kind of the wedge that we're trying to bring and build and, and insert into the market is um, let's just build science simulations, science labs, uh, 3D science resources um, that just works. That is curriculum aligned content like t-shirt first built by teachers for teachers. Um, and is easy to use. So hardware agnostic works on existing browsers, works on mobile devices. So very, very, very easy to use. Um, um, so that it just solves problems. So we don't go around telling teachers we're building VR, whatever immersive content, because those are just buzzwords at the end of the day. I think if it's solving an actual problem, which is teachers aren't able to teach uh, beyond Google Slides, for example, or beyond um, two dimensional modes of, 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 of content. The other challenge on the student front is, unfortunately, over the last few years, the engagement levels in classrooms are dropping significantly because most children are coming from platforms like TikTok and Roblox, um, where um, you get access to much more bite-sized content and content is much more interactive. And then you come to the classroom and you listen to somebody talking for 45 minutes or you go online and you watch a video of somebody writing on a whiteboard and talking for 30 minutes and explaining a concept. That just does not work. I mean, there's enough evidence that attention spans will just will are, are dropping significantly um, and it's not going to make the cut for somebody to sit and watch a lecture of somebody talking so learning has to be active hands-on and uh, we saw an opportunity to do that with the immersive space with immersive content right so when you saying that you take this directly to the teacher can can you unpack this uh, for my listeners please we work with the teacher to understand what she's teaching um, and uh, give her resources. Um, very often teachers will themselves say that, oh, I wish I could have my students um, visualize a eukaryote cell. Oh, I wish I could have my students look at the human anatomy and understand how dissection takes place. Oh, in physics, many teachers want uh, physics simulators to simulate Newton's laws of motion, to simulate projectile motion where you can change gravity. Um, so we have all these simulators that we've built. I mean, projectile motion, throw a ball on the moon, see where the ball goes. Um, let's change gravity. Let's go to a different planet now. Let's go to space and throw a ball again. Let's predict the path of the ball. Um, that sort of intuitive um, engine-based uh, uh, simulators is what we've built uh, and what we kind of, sometimes it requires some onboarding, some training as well to allow the teachers to become comfortable with using them. And very often these would be assigned as class activities, as homework activities. All our content is customizable. So as an instructor, you can add your own annotations. Very soon you can gamify them um, to make them into more interesting puzzles or challenges um, and they're all multiplayer so you can actually do it with your peers um, real time and live and so um, that uh, is kind of the entire product ecosystem that we are trying to build for teachers so so uh, are you saying that this would eventually take the brick and mortar education out of the system because you are giving anything and everything that a teacher or educator requires to connect with the student teach is that where you're getting at it's easy to get hung over when you see a new technology like VR and be like oh how does this do better in terms of what is happening already in the classroom or oh, we have classroom interactions that happen what if we built a vr classroom what if i took you all into vr and i was teaching you with a whiteboard and everything else right it's, it's very natural to try to replace or do an incremental improvement in the virtual space of something that fairly works fine um, in an in an in-person setting um, or maybe there are certainly there are advantages to building a virtual classroom i mean you can, you can have a classroom of people from all over the world very interesting very promising right um, but what excites me more much more is not how vr can do better than the previous mode of instruction but what does vr unlock that was impossible before and that's where i think we want to be adding value which is it was impossible to learn projectile motion on the moon it was impossible to shrink in size and enter the human body and understand the microscopic components or functions and 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 life processes that are happening at a microscopic level. Um, that was impossible. It was not impossible, but very, very, very expensive to go underwater and look at coral reefs and try to understand um, the marine ecosystem that exists um, somewhere deep, deep, deep down the ocean, as if you were right there. Um, those are the problems we want to solve. Those are the types of experiences we want to be building. Um, and I think there's significantly more opportunities there 
um, to do things that were just not possible before with immersive technologies. It, it's, the, it's the privileged few who are sitting in the cities, uh, you know, have access to quality education. Then you go deeper down in the rural area, there's complete lack, lack of, uh, uh, you know, quality education. There, there is some interesting movement happening uh, on the I- internet, you know, so MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, you know, that's somehow kind of like, you know, give, give, giving access to quality education almost uh, so free. Is there a way where, you know, everybody and, and, and anyone around the world could have equitable uh, access to uh, education? Is, is that, uh, and maybe could education be streamlined because the, the the problem with at least with education and healthcare i see is that it's the two core the most basic need for humans and it's very hierarchical you know if you are a privileged person you get quality education quality healthcare and then it depends upon your how you are placed economically you you get that kind of education do you kind of see a world where education healthcare could be standardized yeah i think that's that's a very loaded question there's a lot of different pieces there that i can uh, unpack or i can reflect on here um and but before that i actually wanted to answer a, an earlier point that you made in your in your in your question which was um tomorrow the art could look like your glasses it could look like something else um that it doesn't look like today and i think that's a very important point to underpin there which is even if you look at something like the smartphone um just go back 25 years um, approximately it looked like this bulky device that was tethered that um, would not fit in your pocket that needed two hours of charging for 30 minutes of battery life um, no one would have imagined that this would be your wallet this would be your financial ecosystem this would be your social identity this would be the ability through which you would access information on the go no one imagined that 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 would be something that would sit in your pocket and that would last 10 hours if not longer at a stretch on one on one charge right and so the form factor of the hardware should not be a limiting factor in imagining what the future could look like for this technology. And that's an important point here. Even from a research perspective, a lot of the research that I uh, had, uh, uh, I was able to do recently has, um, has actually shown that very often even the learning outcomes associated with learning in an immersive space um, can be delivered in very effective ways with 2D desktop interfaces that are that take you into the metaverse through mobile-based interfaces and the classic example here is video games, right? I mean, I would consider a lot of video games that students play, Roblox um, um, and such, um, to be metaverses, to be in the VR or immersive immersive space at the very least, but very few are ever built for um, headsets. I mean, most users on platforms like Rec Room, which are some of the most popular social VR applications, access it from the phone. Um, and the reason why the learning outcomes, the engagement levels are at par with what a headset could deliver is because very often the investment in the content through uh, through the development of better instructional design um, in the in the content itself, understanding how interaction happens, making it more interactive, immersive, um, by giving the user control, giving the user feedback, the ability to manipulate stuff, the ability to real time participate in stuff. That's what drives learning as much as the just sheer affordances of the medium that puts you in this immersive space. So I think investing a lot more of our conversation and our work um, in the space towards how do we make content more interactive? How do we bring the best practices of instructional design to creating content um, for existing platforms um, that will eventually be become cross-platform because the metaverse is not virtual reality. The metaverse is a, a world that can be accessed through VR through AR tools and technologies or through existing tools and technologies um, as well. And trying to invest more in the in the what is the what are the use cases and how we build for them versus how do we make it cool in this fully immersive space um, is I think what might drive more adoption and help us think more sustainably about the future. Now but looking at making classrooms equitable and access to resources equitable is a question that is far, far, far removed today from the from the technology space because you know, asking a much more systemic question, right? I mean, how do we, um, the, there's, the digital divide is a very real thing that uh, was made very evident over the last three years um, of the pandemic um, anywhere in the world, right? Um, uh, that uh, there are people that have access to digital resources, there are people that clearly do not. Um, it is almost always marginalized or underrepresented communities. And this is, unfortunately, if we don't take a more, um, uh, I would say grassroots 
approach to to growth and deployment of new content and new technologies we're going to have the same problem again the first people that are going to get vr are going to be your private schools that can afford to pay for it um and uh, they're going to of course then probably demonstrate better learning outcomes they will then just get that um head start um, and it will again become a catch up game that everybody else is playing so i think um either both taking grassroots efforts and working with education systems and institutions to um look look at large scale state wide district wide deployments and programs that um again go to every child might be ways in which we can try to bring this technology into the hands of learners and students um but that still doesn't solve the digital divide problem the that issue there is much more intersectional um beyond just access to technology um and that requires a lot more stakeholder involvement and participation at least simple things that we can do today as a technology company as well um is uh have, stay very close to our teachers work very closely with all the stakeholders in the ecosystem to understand where um the pitfalls are very often another reason why adoption cannot happen with certain communities and can happen with others very often could be in the onboarding how you onboard um and how you train and how you um invest your time into um um distributing or building awareness about this, this product about the new product that you are building so i think those are the blind spots that we can try to avoid um but uh, it, we require a much more holistic approach um at all levels of the education institution for us to address those fundamental questions of equity why don't we talk about inspirit v, uh, uh, vr what's the pricing plan and who are educators you have reached out to your customers any pricing plan yeah totally um so our product is free um and uh, it will at least access to content will always be free i think uh, increasingly there is a movement in at least in education where people increasingly believe that access to information should not be behind a paywall and so i think anybody that's um trying to sell virtual reality content in in education by putting a paywall behind the content itself in some cases unless it's highly highly specialized hyper specialized content may struggle to to scale that in the long term you want videos to be something that you can interact with you can comment on that is shareable that anybody can upload and customize and remix especially with new social media like instagram reels and tiktok um all the more right video has become a hyper shareable and customizable platform it would be ridiculous to imagine putting it in a bundle and selling it as a package um to to somebody that's what's happening with vr today people are making four or five very very cool very interesting um immersive experiences putting it in a bundle and selling it with hardware with a headset right here is a headset bundle we have a custom solution or we're using a consumer headset and we have 25 250 2000 amazing vr field trips amazing simulations amazing resources and tools it's going to work i mean i think they have the early early um uh advantage of kind of being the first the first mover advantage um in these in these spaces and these sectors but as the creator as the ability to create becomes more democratized as the ability to share becomes more and more democratized um those industries are going to die the 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 selling of content so for us we we already we like we're going to be free from the get go because we what we are building much more um than content is tools that allow anybody to customize content and share this and interact with it and in real time engage with it so i think from a business perspective opportunities to monetize um open up around um building potential marketplaces building um ecosystems where um teachers can create content and teach live on this platform what if tutoring was reimagined what if instruction was reimagined um as a real time engagement in the metaverse in these 3d platforms so those are still very far out their ideas for a k12 teacher um today there are practical problems we can solve but i think tomorrow the opportunities for us we're building the building blocks that allow anybody to create on top of this and uh, that allows us to then both unlock revenue opportunities for an instructor and uh, find ways for us to also monetize as a marketplace right so so possibly stay at the, at the content creation space because i i think you said the uh, content creation uh, i mean for your your content is, is free on, on the channel right help me understand this because i mean you know first of all how do you kind of experience the tutor how does he go about uh, how does he or she go about experiencing the content is it yeah. vr content is it ar content is it just 3d content uh because content creation at least the ar vr part is, is super expensive at least till now How, how how do you go about that explain that 
Yeah, I think the inspiration we draw from the content creation tools that we are building, and this is a work in progress still, um, is from platforms like Roblox. Right, Roblox is fundamentally a create creator platform that allows anybody to build a game. Um, and the idea there is, uh, could you give users the building blocks like Lego does? To create a world, to create an environment. Could I give the teachers tools to create a science lab that's on the moon? Um, and if that's the case, um, what are the building blocks that I have to provide? I have to provide environments. I have to provide specific assets, right? Assets that are relevant to biology, to physics, to chemistry. Um, I have to provide um, certain um, simulators or engines that can illustrate certain concepts, but allow them to annotate on it, allow them to embed their own content on it, embed quiz questions, um, embed other sorts of evaluatory and exploratory assets and information points, um, move things around. So we're building a platform bit by bit. Today, the very basic stuff you can do is annotate 3D models, right? Take a 3D model, um, dissect it, mix and match it, assemble it, put together four or five 3D assets and make a room um, that is teaching an, or illustrating a very specific concept in organic chemistry, for example. Add your own annotations, add a voiceover to it. Um, drop a couple of quiz questions on it. Um, um, change the layout or the spatial arrangement of these things um, in the in the 3D space. Um, so our, our tools are desktop based today, um, but it's built on game engines that allow us to be fully hardware agnostic. The only reason we haven't built for um, the Oculus headset, for example, is only because at least in the K-12 space, that market isn't large enough. And there's a lot more impact we can have today um, by building for the browser and for the mobile first. And those are the focus areas for us. But I think the goal, at least in the next 12 months, if not sooner, is gonna be to just flip that switch and just suddenly have thousands and thousands of these assets and content is available for VR. Um, because the way we built it is that it allows us to just port, be hardware agnostic from the get go. I'm excited for these converging technologies, you know, like these haptic feedback when it kind of actually right. matures how real realistic would be the virtual world and, and yeah obviously th th there are the, the, these super pros you know that uh, I mean you, uh, that everything could be immersive you could touch feel the virtual world what are the negatives of a, a virtual world like this you know when when it actually becomes possibly in in maybe like 20 years 30 years when we can touch feel the virtual world possibly we've got a brain computer interface and things like that <laughs> do, you, do you kind of think about things like that um so yes i mean um we are and um the 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 uh, conf the, in the connection or the place where the confluence of uh, VR with other brain brain BCI interfaces, um, um, haptic technologies and other haptic tools, um, AI, um, another big one that um, um, will start to play a very significant role in the virtual learning space, um, can lead to the blurring of the lines between what is real and what is not. Um, but I think it's very easy to take a very skeptical outlook towards kind of these because the challenges that face VR um, down the road are the challenges that face just general technology engagement, right? Um, privacy, security, safety, identity. Um, these are going to be fundamental questions we have to answer um, and questions we can answer today versus trying to envision what it would look like 50 years later. Um, because these are challenges that existing platforms today face, right? Um, uh, social media is going to become social media in the metaverse. When that happens, um, how do we, especially with children, stay away from predatory advertising, targeted advertising, and in spirit, the metaverse we're building has to be child safe. Um, we will never monetize with ads, but many, many VR companies um, in other sectors naturally are going down the advertising route because there's such a huge opportunity to, to, to look at um, ad integration, personalized feedback, personalized targeted advertising as a way to monetize and grow. So. Um, it's going to become very hard to distinguish what's real and what's not in that sense in terms of what is something that's being targeted at you um, that is taking advantage of the personally identifiable information that the system has about you. Um, and those are going to be more fundamental questions that we need to solve um, or we need to be concerned about today. Um, um, and uh, and I think that's uh, that's where my mind's at right now, especially with 
the, the products that we're building for kids. Um, um, we don't ever track any data around um, one's um, session interactions that can lead us back to identifying who the person is, because that's a, a violation of a lot of FERPA laws that um, are very strongly established um, and also is not something that our goals are. I mean, our goal is not to, uh, in the future, um, target ads at a student um, in the in the metaverse, but it is to give opportunities for people to learn in much more creative ways. So um, just thinking through uh, what are the privacy impl implications, what are the safety and security implications, VR is not a safe place yet um, for a child, especially social VR, because we don't have all those safeguards in place right. um, or um, how communication occurs, how peer-to-peer -peer interactions happen. It's much harder to track um, because that trail, the paper trail, the history trail as well, given that so much of it is real time and there is an information overload around you, um, tracing back to moments in time where something happened, an instance of abuse, an instance of um, um, uh, unsafe um, behavior. Um, or bad behavior, negative behavior happened. It's very hard to trace back to who did it. Anonymity is such a big thing in the metaverse where it's very hard to um, trace it back to the perpetrators in so many cases. So it, it's a very complicated um, uh, set of challenges and questions that need to be addressed for anybody that's building a social multiplayer 3D interactive metaverse um, of sorts, um, which is something we might want to move towards in a five-year timeline. Um, and so these are going to be extremely fundamental questions we need to answer as we build that out. Right. Yeah, Aditya, I mean, it, it's it's so nice that you bring these things up because I, I guess, you know, most of the time, you know, when we're having conversation, you know, it, it's always about the hype, about the metaverse and how it can create, uh, you know, great things, huge economical benefits. But nobody talks about the problems with it, you know, because, yes, I think I, I completely agree that all of these technologies can create huge benefits. You know, it, it can completely upend education, healthcare, work, training. But there are so many things that we are completely overlooking and as as somebody who's been invested in the space i think we need to be a little bit more vocal about the downsides of this technology what happens to a world you know when we have a, a xr glasses ar vr mr whatever glasses with inside outside tracking you know and, you, and wherever you go whatever you're looking at you know that, that data is being tracked so the, these are questions i think we need to like really you know, look at it in a very serious way rather than, you know, putting it, brushing it under the the the, the, the okay. carpet. Yeah. So if educators and institutes who would want to kind of reach out to you, where can they reach out? Oh, they can go to our website in spiritvr.com. That's I N in spiritvr.com. Um, and the product is largely self-serve, so they can jump right in and start using the 3D labs at the very least um, in their day-to-day -day teaching and learning. Um, it's all available online for free. Um, you can just make a free account and get going. Um, but if you want to get involved in a much more hands-on way, either in creating content, shaping the future of this movement, because we want to build a movement here and we want to do this with as many people as possible, then please reach out to me. I am more than happy to put you in touch with the right members of the team. We work with tons of teachers and students Every single time, I think right now we have at least 10 or 20 teachers on our team, as well as as freelancers, as part time supporters, as as consultants, as advisors that are helping us across the board, across every single function, function of the organization, content, product, design, curriculum, um, um, integration in the classroom, teacher training, um, all sorts of functions and students as well. Similarly, um, college students, high school students that are looking for jobs and internships as well. So um, reach out to me directly if you want to get involved in a more hands-on way, but if you want to use the product, you can just directly get started. It's all on the website. We are launching new stuff every single day. So I would encourage you to subscribe um, to our newsletter, um, which is again, you can do on our website because you'll get the latest product updates. So some really exciting 3D worlds that are coming up that are going to be dropped in the next one to two months. And I would love for you to not miss on seeing that. Right. What would be your pitch to these educators and institutes here in India? Obviously, you've, you've kind of described your platform, but can you su summarize as a pitch for them? Yeah, so I mean, uh, if you're a science teacher in a middle, primary, middle or high school classroom, and you are struggling to teach your students um, uh, something that's an interactive visual concept in science, we probably have a lab or a 3D experience for you. So. Our platform allows you to integrate 
any sort of 3D interactive experience directly into your classroom teaching or your homework assignment to your kids. And so if you want to access 3D interactive resources for science teaching and learning, please come to us. We'd love to help you succeed and give you tools um, that will make learning more engaging. How is education going to look in the next 10 years? Yeah, I mean, uh, I um, what is education going to look like in the next 10 years? It's going to hopefully be much more um, hands-on. It's going to be hopefully be much more collaborative, much more student-driven um, in that um, students get to shape their own learning journeys um, and get to shape what they learn and how they learn. And we'll see, we're seeing this happening already where education is less and less becoming a necessity and much more of a choice for more and more people. And if you have the privilege of seeing education as a choice, then you're going to only learn things that truly make and add value to you and to your career and to your goals. And so I think with Immersive and XR blending into the classroom and into learning spaces, um, the opportunities for more collaborative, personalized, um, hands-on learning become possible. And that makes me very excited. I wish you the, the very best into my listeners. What, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you so this. much. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you.